Okay, so in the last class, we saw uh, the calibration blocks and we learned how these blocks are given a particular number and from that number, you could not only identify the block, but you could also get the dimensions of the block and also the flat bottom hole that you have to calibrate uh, the instrument. Okay, so in this class today, uh, we will see uh, how these blocks are used to do the calibration. Okay. So, we will first uh, take up the distance amplitude calibration and then uh, we will go on to see the area amplitude calibration. Okay? So, first let us start with uh, distance amplitude calibration. So, for this what you need to do? Uh, first you need to select a particular block number and in case of uh, distance calibration that block is number 5 block which is this one. Okay? So, the first step is uh, take this block ok. So, what is this block? Now, you can easily identify uh, what kind of block is this. This is having a flat bottom hole, uh, the diameter of which is uh, 5 by uh, 64 of an inch or 2 mm. Okay. And uh, the metal distance in this case, as you could see uh, from these four numbers, is 3 inches or 75 mm. Okay. So, you have a 2 mm uh, diameter hole. and 75 mm of metal distance in the first block that you have selected in order to uh, calibrate the distance. Okay. So, now what we are going to do? Uh, we are going to keep this uh, hole size constant okay and then vary this uh, metal distance by selecting other blocks and collect a number of data points in terms of uh, the distance. Okay. So, we will collect the intensity of the echoes coming out from this flat bottom holes as a function of metal distance. Okay. So, with that uh, data we can plot a curve which can be used for calibrating the distance. So, take that block this uh, number 5 block and do this. Now, take the ultrasonic uh, probe and move the probe over the block horizontally. So, from one side of the diameter to the other side uh, horizontally you move it till you get a maximum signal from the flat bottom hole. Okay. So, you have to move it because you need to get the maximum signal out of this uh, flat bottom hole. That means, your ultrasonic uh, transducer probe should be right above the uh, hole, so that you get a maximum signal. Okay. And once you uh, get that uh, maximum signal, you need to adjust it to one fourth of the maximum height. And that you can do by adjusting the gain control that you have in the instrument. So, bring down this uh, maximum signal to one fourth. Okay. One fourth of the maximum attainable height or metal uh, or attainable intensity that you have. So, uh, you need to do it by using this gain. So, that means, at this point in time, I should also tell you. Uh, 
what do you mean by gain and how you control it. Okay. Gain uh, as the name suggests uh, you may all know this is to uh, increase or decrease a particular intensity or an amplitude of, an, of a signal. Okay. So, in this case uh, the gain is uh, about uh, increasing or decreasing a sound wave signal and it is defined in this case as twenty log A two by A one that means A one is the initial amplitude and if you increase it to A two. So, the ratio the log of this ratio multiplied by twenty is the gain in uh, sound waves it will be in terms of decibel. For example, if you uh, increase the amplitude twice, okay, then gain will be twenty into log two or 6 decibel. Okay. So, this is how uh, gain is defined and there will be a knob on the instrument. Uh, so, through that turning that knob you can adjust the gain you can either increase or decrease it. Okay. So, in this case we need to uh, decrease it by adjusting the gain. So, that the maximum height of the echo that you got from the flat bottom hole that should be brought down to one fourth of the maximum height. Okay. So, that is how you set the control first the gain control and now once you set this gain control and make it uh, one fourth of the maximum height you use the other blocks the other metal distances that you have and after that uh, for the other blocks you do not touch this gain control. Okay. So, the gain control is set only once in the beginning for the first block and when you obtain uh, the echoes uh, from the other blocks, okay, in those cases you simply need, need to note down the height of the echo which is uh, coming from the flat bottom hole without adjusting the gain control. Okay. So, that is the next step you uh, take the other blocks. But in this case also you need to get a maximum signal from the flat bottom hole and once you get the maximum simply note the height of the, the peak without adjusting the gain control. Okay. Yeah, so that is a next step uh, read the heights of the peaks after getting the maximum signal from the hole for each of the other blocks without uh, touching the gain control. So, once you collect the data or uh, the intensity or height of the peaks of the echoes uh, coming out from the flat bottom hole as a function of the distance, then you can take this data and uh, draw a plot. Okay. So, that plot will look like this. So, this height or intensity of the peaks or the echo from the flat bottom hole that is plotted 
as a function of distance. Okay. Then you will get a curve like this if you plot this, which will look like this. Okay. But any intensity with respect to distance goes by uh, this particular relationship. That means, the intensity is inversely proportional uh, to the square of the distance. Okay? So, if i be the intensity and l be the distance, so this will be the relationship. But in this case, you could see uh, first uh, it is increasing, then going to a peak and after that only it is decreasing. Okay? So, up to this point, it is not really following this particular relationship, only beyond this point it is following that relationship and decreasing. Okay? So, that means, along this line you have two different regions which are behaving differently with the respect to the intensity as a function of distance. Okay? So, can you guess what these two uh, regions could be from uh, what we have discussed so far, particularly in the nature of the beam uh, which is used to do ultrasonic testing. So, let me uh, explain to you. So, if you remember in the ultrasonic beam, uh, we have seen this the shape of the beam is something like this and then uh, close to the probe, we have seen that there are a lot of fluctuations and this particular region is known as near field and the other one is far field. Okay. So, in the near field there are a lot of fluctuations. So, even after transmitting uh, the probe will uh, still vibrate for some time okay? and by that time if any echo comes back to it, it would not be able to receive because any transducer when it is transmitting cannot receive. Okay? So, for the probe uh, to receive the echoes, uh, these all the vibrations that you have should uh, die down completely. Okay? So, that means in the near field uh, if the echo is coming from a very small distance uh, from the probe, uh, then the probe will find it difficult to receive that echo. Okay? On the other hand, if the echo is coming uh, from a larger distance within the near field, then the receiving will be better and uh, the uh, signal intensity will be higher, okay? signal intensity which is being received by the probe within the near, near field, then in that case we will increase as the distance is increased within the near field. Okay? So, that means in this case, this region that you have where you see that the intensity is increasing with increasing distance is the near field because as I told in the near field if you increase the distance the receiving is better because the probe will have longer time for all these fluctuations to come down and then it will be ready to receive. Okay? So, as you increase the distance in the near, near field the receiving would be better and the signal intensity would be higher. Okay? So, that, that is exactly you see in this in this distance amplitude curve okay? and that means the other side that you have, the other region that you have that is the far field wherein it will follow uh, this particular relationship because in the far field there is no question of any uh, fluctuation. So, when you are in the far field, the 
signal intensity of the echoes will decrease as the distance is increased. Okay. So, that is why the curve, the DSE curve or the distance uh, amplitude correction curve looks like this. It first increases as a function of distance, then it decreases. Okay. So, this was about uh, distance amplitude calibration or distance amplitude correction. Now, let us go ahead and see how the area calibration is done. Okay. So, we could use the same blocks, but for calibrating the area as I would have said before also, you need to keep the metal distance fixed and you have to vary the size of the hole or the area of the hole. Okay. So, let us see how the area calibration is done. So, in case of uh, blocks uh, which are used for calibrating the area, only a single number is given like 1, 2, uh, 3, 4, 5 and so on. Okay. This is according to the size of the hole that you have because in this case as I said you need to vary the size of the area of the hole and the numbers are given uh, in such a manner that uh, the area of the hole is proportional to this the square of the number. Okay. So, for example, uh, if you have uh, selected a number 5 hole, then the relative area will be 25. Okay. So, this is how uh, you can collect the data or collect the signal intensities uh, from this hole as a function of the area by simply providing the square of this number as the area. Actually, these numbers are given in accordance with the diameter of the holes in terms of 1 by 64th of an inch. For example, if the number is 1, then you know the diameter would be 1 by 64th inch or 0.4 mm. Similarly, 2 will be 2 by 64th inch or 0.8 mm and so on. Okay, so, now you can easily correlate why the area of the hole is proportional to the square of the number. Okay. So, in this case what do you do uh, like what we have done uh, for calibrating the distance, you first select a particular block. So, in case of area calibration the number 5 block is first taken. So, that is your uh, first data point and as I said this uh, for this block uh, the area of the hole would be 25 uh, because as I said the area is uh, proportional to the square of the number. So, take this uh, number 5 block, move the probe and get a maximum signal. from the hole. Okay. Once you get the maximum signal, adjust the gain control and make it one third in this case of the maximum height of the echo. Okay. So, in case of a distance calibration we saw it was uh, adjustment was done up to one fourth of the maximum height and in this case we do it up to one third of the maximum height. And next uh, like what we have done before also 
take the other blocks and get a maximum signal for each of them and then next is read the height of the echo for all other blocks. the echo from the hole without adjusting the gain. Okay. So, this is how you collect the data. Okay. You first uh, take a particular block which is number uh, 5 in this case, get a maximum signal, then adjust the gain control, make it one third. And for rest of the blocks, uh, you simply get the maximum signal uh, from the flat bottom hole and note down uh, the height of the echoes. Okay. So, this is how you get the data, the intensity of the echo as a function of uh, area of the holes. So, now you need to plot it. So, plot the heights. So, in this case we can plot in terms of uh, percent of uh, maximum indication height as a function of a relative area relative area because uh, the area is proportional to the square of the number, relative area unit. Then the curve or the plot will look like this. Okay. So, in this case uh, the first data point if you remember uh, was for one third that is uh, around 33 percent. So, let us say this is 20 and this is 30. So, it was and it was for a number 5 block. So, this relative area is proportional to the square of the number. So, that means, uh, the first point was 25 and 33. So, it was somewhere around here. Okay. So, this is your uh, first data point which is uh, 2533 because we have plotted in terms of uh, percentage in the y axis. So, that is 33 percent in this case or one third and uh, x axis is the relative area which is the square of the number of the block. So, this was for number uh, 5 block which means it is 25. Okay. So, first what you do? Uh, you draw a curve or draw a, a straight line uh, through this point and the origin. Okay. So, since uh, your reference point or the point with respect to which you are standardizing the whole thing is this, this particular point is therefore known as point of standardization. Okay. And then you see rest of the points uh, how they are, where they are falling, whether they are falling on this curve or if 
there is any if you note any deviation if there is any deviation you simply have to note that deviation for a particular hole size and when you do the test uh, this is the correction that you need to provide okay, for that particular size. Uh, one thing you should remember here you are getting some idea about uh, the size of the defect because that is what the idea is in this case. Okay. You have calibrated the area by using these holes and now uh, while you are doing the actual test if you get a signal whose intensity is matching to the intensity of any of the holes then uh, you could say that the size of that flaw is close to the size of that particular hole. Okay. But one thing you should uh, remember this uh, flat bottom holes that we have uh, introduced uh, by precisely drilling okay, is an ideal reflector. But the actual flaws are not ideal reflector. Okay. So, what does that mean? That means the idea of the size uh, that you are estimating uh, from this particular curve okay, is the lower limit of the size of the flaw. Okay. So, that means uh, the size if it is matching uh, with a hole you can say that the size of the flaw is at least equal to that particular hole whose echo intensity is matching with the echo intensity of that particular flaw. Okay. So, it is at least equal to that. It may be bigger than that, but we can say that it is at least equal to the size of that particular hole. Okay. So, this is one thing that uh, you should keep in mind that size that you estimate uh, from this particular calibration curve is the lower limit uh, for the actual size of the flaw. Okay. Right. So, uh, this is how uh, using uh, this set of blocks you would be able to calibrate uh, the instrument, the ultrasonic instrument for distance and for area. So, when you uh, calibrate the instrument uh, for distance the advantage that you have let me tell you apart from uh, you know to make it uh, free of error that is the first objective of doing calibration. But in this case the another advantage that you have when you uh, calibrate the instrument for distance is that you would be uh, able to get some idea about uh, the depth or location of the defect if your instrument is properly calibrated. Okay. Because uh, this time base that you have in the display So, this is the initial pulse, this is the back wall and x axis uh, shows you the time, uh, the time at which uh, the echoes appear okay, to the probe or the echoes come back to the probe. Okay. So, this time can be converted into distance if you know the velocity of sound wave in the material which is being tested. Okay. And most of the time it is known because in most of the common metals, alloys and many other materials the velocity of sound is known. So, if you uh, provide the velocity of sound this time can be uh, converted into distance because we know uh, distance is velocity into time. Okay. But in this case uh, the other thing that you should remember okay, this has to be divided by 2 because the waves are going back and forth. 
it is going here hitting the reflecting interface which could be the back wall or any other defect or flaws and then coming back. Okay. So, this is going back and forth. So, that is why when you calculate the distance it has to be divided by 2. Okay. So, that means once you uh, give this uh, V as an input to the instrument this time base can be converted into depth or distance. And now, if your instrument is properly calibrated with respect to depth or distance, then you could see what depth uh, a defect is appearing. So, that is where the defect is lying which you could see directly on the display itself. Okay. So, this is the advantage that you have when your instrument is properly calibrated. Similarly, uh, if you calibrate the instrument uh, for the area, then as I said you would be able to get some idea about the size of the flaw at least the lower limit of the size. Okay. So, by doing the calibration you are not only getting error free results, but you also get to know or you get some idea about uh, the location of the defect and some idea about uh, the size also. Okay. So, ultrasonic testing in that sense uh, provide you some quantitative information also although it is primarily a qualitative test, but uh, through this kind of calibration and this kind of calculations you would be able to get some idea about uh, the depth at which the defects are located and also some idea about uh, the size of the flaws. Okay. So, this is how calibration helps you, but as you could see uh, in this case this is primarily for a normal probe okay, which is going perpendicular uh, to the surface like this, but there are many scenarios in which you have to use an angle probe, you have to use an incident angle and uh, for that uh, case also you need to calibrate the instrument. And as you would have realized by using this kind of uh, simple uh, cylindrical block uh, you cannot uh, calibrate the angle pros because here there is no incident angle as such. So, that means when you want to use an angle probe you need uh, some other kind of uh, reference block or calibration block which would be able to calibrate the angles as well. Okay. So, that is what we are going to talk about next as to how to calibrate angle probes and what kind of calibration block uh, is available uh, for calibrating the angle probes. Okay. But for today this is all I will have, I will take that up in the next class, but for today I will stop here. Thank you for your attention.